Almas, why don't you give an overview to the audience of your diamond approach, for those who are unfamiliar with it, and perhaps, if you like, you can compare and contrast it to Advaita Vedanta, but you may have to give an example of what that is as well. <clears throat> well, uh, I teach a particular approach to uh, actualizing the total human potential. And really, what we find out, if we explore the human potential, that most of it is not conscious, is not the physical and the emotional, that's just the surface. So a big part of it is the spiritual sphere and uh, matter of spirit. So the teaching uh, is mostly about is, uh, how to open up or to access the spiritual dimension of our reality, of our existence. And in my approach, I use Western methodology, like I use Western uh, psychology, for instance. I integrate that as part of the methodology of how to open up. I use inquiry, which is sort of like similar to Socratic inquiry as a particular method. That, for me, is more important than sitting meditation, although we employ sitting meditation, too, of different kinds. But the idea is to find out, what the hell are we? What's going on? What am I? What am I? What is the world or universe? What is the nature of the universe? That's how I started, actually, why I started in science. I want to know what is the truth of reality. So I went very far, as you know, in studying physics and math, until at some point I realized I wasn't getting it. I wasn't, that's not for me. I wasn't getting what, where I wanted to go. I didn't know consciously where I wanted to go. But as I got deeper into physics and also conversing with scientists, and I realized that... Uh, it's a, it's a, the approach is good, wonderful, and very useful. I'm interested in it, love it, all of that, and I was good at it. It it was from here up, you know. Didn't include the heart. Didn't include the other capacities we have. So the approach uses, uh, as I use, I said, uses inquiry but uses the scientific method in some kind of way, which means I have, it has to be verified, not by experiment, as is done in physics, but by experience, by one's own direct experience, not what I hear, not what I learn from teaching, what I can verify and repeatedly, and then can verify in other people, and other people do. Which at the beginning, where my friends, my students, was the, the teaching was developing. So, and but it is what what develops is a certain perspective about the spiritual dimension. That the spiritual dimension is not just one thing. It's not like you experience consciousness, and you know what consciousness is, and that's it. You see, Advaita Vedanta, for instance is uh, a teaching about realization of pure consciousness to recognize that one is that one's true self is pure consciousness uh, uh, that has no limits uh, no size no shape and that it is also the nature of everything and that is part of the teaching I, I give, but my teaching is not is a, a little bit more nuanced, I would say, because that has more detail, and some people think of it as more complex. But uh, because the the spiritual dimension for me is not just one dimension. Like consciousness for me is one dimension. Emptiness, another dimension, which Buddhism emphasizes. Love is another dimension. You see, and creative dynamism, what makes things happen. You see, uh, very, very dynamic, they, don't, they don't differentiate those that much. I mean, they include them in consciousness, but sort of implicitly so. 
I differentiate into different dimension, and then those dimension can also express themselves in human experience, individual experience, as particular what I call spiritual qualities. What I call spiritual qualities like the quality of clarity, the quality of compassion, uh, quality of sincerity, the quality of uh, will. You see, steadfastness. And there are many of those qualities. I know at least 40 or 50 of those. I, I don't think I know all of them. They're similar to what's called the Platonic uh, ideas. You see, in some sense, they are the Platonic ideas be, behind what we know, like when we say love. Many human beings experience love. But what is the Platonic idea of love? What is the true uh, spiritual counterpart to what a human being called love and turns out to be a very particular way of experiencing consciousness. So my approach is basically is how to learn about the spiritual qualities which make us be able to connect to the spiritual sphere, which in my work, the emphasis is in presence and ontological presence, the presence of consciousness, not just conscious as uh, function of consciousness and the presence, the being is of it. And then connects into the more than undual, which is similar to Advaita Vedanta. And then recognize the non dual has more nuances. And, and then connecting the non dual with the ordinary life. How is it? How, how do we live? If, we are, if I'm infinite consciousness, how do I live a human life? What lives and how do I live? And that, of course, a big part of spiritual realization of most teachings, you see. And so I teach that too. I work with that. But then I, I leave the door open for... Uh, the spiritual universe to reveal other possibilities because there are other possibilities of knowing reality, for instance, which if we really go into it, it takes us back similar to some of the physics, quantum theory, you know. Um, How so? Perspective. Well, let me give this example. If you have uh, a Buddhist master and Veda master sitting in the same room, the Buddha says nature of reality is emptiness, and that's what the experience, what the person experiences. Em emptiness is the spacious emptiness, is what I experience. It is the fundamental ground. The Advaita Vedanta person says that no, the, the fundamental. Uh, Nature of reality is pure consciousness. It's conscious of itself. And it's not emptiness. It's characterized by being. While the Buddhists say characterized by non-being. Now, they're both right in my perspective. But each one of them says this is the ultimate. So how can they be both the ultimate? And in my exploration, I find out that they're both correct. However, if what is really there is the ultimate real, fundamental truth, how can people experience it so differently? And so my, through my own investig spiritual investigation, the tradition and my experience, and, is that the, how we experience what is the truth depends on the experiencer. On the, on the person. Different people can experience it differently. There are different ways reality, reality manifests. So the experiencer is what makes reality appear in a certain way. That brings us to quantum theory. You see, the experiencer is needed for the, for the, for the quantum wave to collapse to, be, to manifest in a certain way. Before that, we don't know what it is. So the observer, that's what uh, quantum theory says, here, you know, is, is the experiencer, just similar to that, but the experiencer is experiencing uh, inward reality instead of experimenting, observing something external. 
So I I, <laughs> I look at, at the spiritual realization as I have what's called the quantum theory of spirituality, which is that uh, that the, the spiritual truth is indeterminate until we experience it. And how we experience it depending it depends on our worldview, our view of reality, depends on our expectation, but it depends on our readiness and openness. So that for me explains many traditions, why there are so many traditions, you know, different kind of teachings.